Hi, Carmen. Hi, how are you? Doing all right. How are you today? I'm so glad to finally get in touch with you people. Um, I have a, uh, an issue. It's big. I'm praying to the Lord to help me to make it concise to get my point across to you. Okay. Uh, I've been divorced now for three years, my second divorce. I've been a Christian for 25 years, and I never dreamed that I would have two divorces. But um, also a victim of child abuse and diagnosed, I live on SSI right now, diagnosed with major treatment-resistant depression. Mm, um, that's that's my hard. Big issue, it is. It's been very hard, and I've suffered a lot of losses in my life, and I try not to live as a victim, but it affects me. Mm, um, sure. Okay. My question is, I've been divorced from my husband for three years, and I cannot seem to let go of him. He... We divorced on grounds of financial and emotional abuse. Hmm. Um, he had a terrible problem with lust. I found many things out about him. How long were you married to him? About 10 years. 10 years, okay. And the pornography started really, really early in the relationship. And like I said, about the handful of uh, devastating things that I found out, I, I, th- I, I assume there were many more things that I didn't find out. He still suffers with lust, and he asks me to pray for him. Mm. But I miss him. I love him, and I'm very hung up on the fact that I vowed to be with him in good times and in bad, for better or for worse. Yeah. And you were just talking about heart attacks. He suffered a major heart attack. He lost half of his heart. And I'm, he's older than I am. I'm, I just live in fear that I will regret the way I did regret my first divorce. Hmm. Um, and it's keeping me stuck. I have a new relationship forming with a very good man uh, who was just much more compatible to me. But I, it's getting in the way that I really can't. Okay. So the question for us is what? Is it okay? How can I feel God's permission to let this man go that I actually did divorce when I actually still really care for him and love him? care about his life, but the new man in my life, of course, doesn't want him to have anything to do with me, any place. Sure. There's, there's grandchildren right. involved in Okay. But Carmen, do you know that as long as you hold on to him, your heart's divided? Yes. Yeah. Oftentimes, victims of abuse have a lot of stuff they struggle with, and one of the things is a belief that I can't trust anyone. And so it's part of what keeps them distant in relationships. And you, I mean, for him to be struggling with financial abuse, emotional abuse, uh, pr- pornography, sex addiction, you were saying he had a heart attack and he lost half his heart. And I thought, you know, he never gave her his whole heart. You only had half his heart anyway. So what are you holding on to? And are you holding on to him so that you don't have to give your heart to someone else? It may be fear. I'm not sure. Um, yes, and if, you, if I went down the list, I don't want to be- talk bad about him, but everybody I ever explain it to, it's very clear to them that I, sh- you know, I should have divorced him and to let him go. But there's a fondness. There's, there's like I said, a fear of regretting of him dying and me regretting that I didn't spend the rest of my life with him. Well, where is he right now? You know, he's off in Texas. He goes to Texas every winter and leaves me alone. <laughs> mm-hmm. Up here in Minnesota where it's very cold. And, okay. Um, so how far did his lust uh, problem and sexual addiction go? How far did he take that? Well, the last thing that I found was just horrendous. I found uh, cross-dressing clothes. Mm-hmm. And... Um, he did something I've never found out about. I was actually put in the Mayo Clinic with the, before my depression about a year ago, and while I was in there, uh, he did something terrible. He, when I got out, the ride home was silent. He fell to his knees when we got in the door and cried and said he did something atrocious and terrible, and he's never confessed to me what that was. Um, okay. But obviously it was something sexual and something very terrible. And yeah. Like I said, everybody else seems to just say, move on and get rid of him. I want to, I forgive him. I can only remember the good things. Yeah. You know, Carmen, one of the things that's true about people who are victimized and have histories of victimization, 
or who are put in situations where they're being held hostage or they've been kidnapped or they're being victimized is they develop a bond with the person with whom uh, they have been abducted. And so part of bonding with a perpetrator is a part of what we naturally do as human beings. It's, it's very common. But, you know, I have an unusual thought in my mind, and that is, um, you know, maybe mutual healing could occur if you got into the right circumstances where he could heal and you could heal. Because one of the things that's really, I talk to a lot of people, Carmen, and I can tell you really still care for this guy. I can hear it in your voice. And maybe you need to have some closure with him to say, you know, I still deeply care for you. Would you like to embark upon a journey of mutual growth in the Lord and a, a place where we could set apart a time to, to embark upon couples counseling? You could get involved in sexual addiction counseling, Every Man's Battle Weekend, and we can help support each other and determine if we could ever get back together again. Maybe you need to create that, Carmen, in order to create the closure you need to move on. Because I can tell you love him. Now, you will have lost nothing by extending yourself to him because you're already invested in him. So to ask him some questions might be worth it to allow yourself to have some closure. Now, that's that's my unusual take on this situation. And I don't know what Steve and Sherry think, but it's, it's an idea, okay? Because I hear that you really love this guy. Yeah, I do, and people don't understand it. And I do hear you about the, you know, it sounds very deranged that a person would become attached well, to someone who's... Well, we, we all have a little bit of deranged inside of us. We're <laughs> fallen, broken creatures. We all do these kinds of things. Steve, what were you going to say? I was going to say that a person with um, resistant depression, the worst place you could live would be in limbo. Uh, yes, and so, I've been hospitalized for so the last you, years, Yeah, times. so you need to do one thing or another. I know. I and I think happened. I think you ought you could you know you don't have the money to fly to Texas right? right? So I think you just have to wait, and I think you ought to go see your ex, and I think you ought to see how that goes. One of two things going to happen: you're either going to say yes, we need to get some counseling and see if we can put this back together, or you're going to say wow. I so fantasized about high, how high idealistic mm-hmm. this this reunion would be, and now I see the reality. I am now going to move on. But you tell the person that you're dating, we need to take a little break because I need to tie up the loose ends because it's not fair to you or me to go forward with this much loose end tied up and see if he'll understand that. I hope he does. He with does this have much loose end heart. not tied up, I mean. Yeah. You know, Sherry. I mean, my bells and whistles are going off. Well, but Sherry, ben. I was gonna, but Sherry, I was gonna ask you a question because sometimes yeah. what victims do is they'll tolerate the intolerable and they'll hang to the good moments and tolerate massive levels of abuse. They do, and they'll just hang on the the agree, good moments. They, so, what are your thoughts on that as a counterweight here? Well, we do that. We we do because we idealize that person. Mm-hmm. Um, we may feel like inside. We, if if they would just pick me, then I. If they would just come back to me, then I mm-hmm. could be healed. Maybe then I would be important. Maybe I, maybe then I'd be worth it, um, worth it for someone to fight for. I mean, there's such an idealized place that I'm hearing in you, Carmen, and I'm so fighting for your heart. But I, I probably am going to take a, a different reaction than these two gentlemen. I'm hearing more vulnerability, and I, I think that there are some thoughts and beliefs that you have that you haven't really gone into yet. You're stuck in your grief. But I think one of your greatest fears is, I don't want to be alone. You're right, Sherry. I think I think I relate more to what you said. I feel like what Mylon said, I, I, I admire it, but it just seems like taking a step back. Yeah. In a new relationship, this, we are much more compatible as far as personality as far as him being um, more noble and as far as a husband, the ideal that I was raised with as a child, um, and and as far as God's standards, he's much more of a a godly man. I don't see my first husband changing. 
I um, agree with you. He may, but it is a long shot. And for you to, to get closer towards grieving and letting go, I think the further that you move forward with this new gentleman, it's going to feel scarier to move towards him. And it might feel safer to go back, kind of, you know, to want to go back to Egypt, you know, the leeks, and I want to go back and eat all that stuff I used to eat, and I don't like wandering in the wilderness. Kind of like Steve talked about, the worst place you can be is in limbo, and you have been wandering for three years. Well, and then my faith tells me, like the Bible, and maybe it's religion, that I should be give up my life for a friend, that if I just give up, you know, do what he wants, live his life on the road, and submit to his way, which are very nonconformist ways that God would somehow bless me for staying with him. But well, but that's a victim's. That's that's what victims choose to see in the scriptures. All the scriptures that say lose yourself. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. they tend to selectively read the scriptures and find the ones that identify with that tendency to put up with too much, and as I said earlier, to to tolerate the intolerable. So you have you two. You have two choices here. Um, Carmen and and I love that Sherry's counterweight here. I love that, and um, I think that's part of making decisions is listening to multiple views as mm -hmm. to what your choices are, and then picking the one that you think you need to take. And then Sherry, Steve, moving boldly with that, and yeah. and going with the direction. Well, that's why I said one one or the other, and it sounds like to me, the one is preferable to the other. So mm -hmm. go go the direction you're headed and go. Now I've got one final question for you. Tell me about your exercise life. My exercise life mm -hmm. is almost non existent here, and it's very cold outside. Mm -hmm. and makes me resistant to, to being outside at all in the winter. Okay. I've heard you talk about that before. and um, I cannot imagine uh, someone not telling a person that is resistant to treatment who has severe depression to save every penny you can save and get a treadmill. I've got something in the basement that I need to drag up here. And, and you know, the depression, I had a brain aneurysm this past summer, and the depression since then somehow has lifted. Um, well, that's I don't, interesting, and that happens that's sometimes. That's a factor. I, yeah. I see my mortality a lot more clearly after this aneurysm, and yeah. that's why I feel so pressured to make the right decision with relationships. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, have we helped you? Yes, you have. I, All right. <laughs> you kind of gave me both sides of the way I think about it. I'm still kind of in the middle, but... Um, maybe Henry's I, book, maybe Henry's book, Necessary Endings, might be helpful for you to begin to see what God wants to build in 2012 yeah. and maybe wants to redeem. I'm going to send that to you, and um, I hope that that will be helpful to you. 